We are at the 2016 Honolulu Surf Film Festival, and this was the night that Anna Trent Moore was going to give her talk story session on Bud Brown. But in reality, it is the story of Anna Trent, daughter of surfing legend Buzzy Trent, and Hanai, daughter of Bud Brown, surf filmmaker. This is Anna's story. Thank you for those kind words and mahalo everybody for being here. And yes, I did come from California for the film festival, but first and foremost, I always call myself a Makaha girl. Always have been, always will be. So even though I reside in California, most of the time Hawaii is always my home. And it is always a joy to be here to share in the film festival. I had a wonderful afternoon with Taylor Chang and we were talking about storytelling and how the film festival shares storytelling of the sport that we dearly love at its finest. And it is always a pleasure for me to come and talk story and do storytelling. So I think what I'll do is show the film first and then afterwards we'll have a talk story and I'd like to share on who Bud Brown was, what he did, and why his work is relevant today to yes, serve. Thank you. We watched a 30-minute film on Bud Brown's story and his foray into the surfing film's arena. And now we will go back to Anna Trent Moore and her personal history with Bud Brown. When I look at the film, I'm not only looking at people that I treasure inside of me or my father did, but I also remind myself that I'm looking at it through Bud's eyes and what he saw and what he preserved for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I was fortunate this year to come to Oahu for a little bit of El Nino. And I was at Waimea one day, and there was a big swell. I think there was a big swell every day this winter in Hawaii. And I was watching the surfing, and it was spectacular. And I thought about how faces come and go. Every person has their time and it all passes. But one of the things that come and go and come again are the waves. And so when I look at the films and I see Butch and I see John and I see Duke and I see Buzzy, I remember that each time has their time and they're all precious. And that our time now is possible because that their time was before us. And so I'm very grateful for that. I'm very fortunate in that I grew up with two amazing storytellers my whole life. One was my father, Buzzy Trent, and the other was Bud Brown. Buzzy Trent was my, my birth father, and he was a prolific storyteller. He told um, his stories orally, um, often and many times. And Bud Brown, who I was Hanai to in many ways, he never married or had children, told his stories through the films. And I was talking to Taylor about storytelling today, like I had, was saying earlier. And in all indigenous cultures, there is a job bequeath to someone who is responsible for the storytelling and the passing of the stories. Because if we don't do that, our stories will be washed away by the tide. And without sounding any bit of arrogant, I like to say that these two men entrusted me with their stories. And so I feel very compelled to share them, polish them, preserve them, and to make sure that they shine bright so that you and the others that follow will be able to learn and treasure and be happy from them. Bud Brown is known in surfing as the father of the surf film and creator of the surf film genre. But first and foremost, he was a man of water. His life as a man of water began as a swimmer. And it was a chance encounter in a swimming pool at the Los Angeles Athletic Club with Duka Hanamoko in 
1934 that inspired a journey on the Mariposa's maiden voyage in 1938, where he came to Hawaii for the first time. And I don't think he surfed. He wasn't even filming surfing. Instead, he was frolicking on the beach, filming Dukahanamoko, who he became friends with, joined the Waikiki Surf Club, and had a wonderful time where he stayed at the Tropicana Inn, which was very reasonable, eating his favorite salad, salad dressing, Tropicana salad dressing. I don't know if it's still around, but he loved it all his life. <laughs> I'd have to buy it and bring it back for him. And it, that is where he first fell in love with Hawaii May. Following that, shortly, World War II broke out, and but joined the Navy. And I always found it ironic, and such a paradox, that during this horrific war, he was touring the Pacific arena, seeing the most beautiful islands of his life that would stay with him forever. Papayete, when there were only two taxis, Bora Bora, which he said was the most beautiful place on earth, and of course, always Hawaii May. After the war, he returned to California, finished college, became a teacher, and he filmed an eight millimeter for fun. He would film surfing, show them to friends, and they just loved them. And he decided that he wanted to take filming a little more seriously, so he bought a Bellenhauser camera and began filming surfing in 16 millimeter. At first, there were films that he would just show at clubs or someone's house. And then eventually, he decided to return to USC and pursue a master's degree in film editing and take it seriously. And it was around 1951 that my history with Bud Brown begins. He said he was at State Beach and he heard someone speaking in rapid fire sentences behind him about sailing to Hawaii, to this place called Makaha, where he would find the biggest wave and he would serve it. Bud turned around and he said that was the first time he saw Buzzy Trent. <laughs> and my father did sail to Hawaii and he did find the biggest wave he could find and he wrote it. He wrote many of them. And Bud Brown followed him in the winter of 1953, where he lived with my father in a concert hut, and he filmed wonderful, spectacular, big Makaha point surf, and decided to make his first surf film. Following that, he went on to make 13 more films. And I guess the rest is history about that. He took a little break in the mid-60s to do something he had always wanted to do, which was to make a love letter to the place that he loved perhaps most of all, Tahiti. And he made the film, You'll Dance in Tahiti. And he showed it two times, and then he put it quietly away, and he went on to film surfing. I've heard from some people that surf history is fading and that not everyone is so interested in it. And at some times that gets me a little discouraged, but only for a moment. Because I don't believe that's true. I think that it is the responsibility of those that hold the stories to polish them and wait and be patient and hope that those that eventually come will open up to it and want to hear it and want to see it. And so that's why I do what I do and I take Bud's films and I share it and I polish them and I open the door so that people can see them and remember where we come from. This film that I did um, was a way for me to marry my writing with Bud's film. I'll never forget a long time ago, I was toying with this idea of writing a book, my first book, 
which was a Buzzy Trent story, Increments of Fear. And how Bud and I would patiently sit at his little viewfinder, looking at films and looking to find pictures and frame grabs. And I put it away for a while, many years in fact, and was never able to follow through with it. And so it was really fun for me to make this film that you saw today is a short little film, because even though he wasn't alive to see it, I was able to marry what I could do with what he did, which was the writing and the film. So I'm really glad that you got to come and see it today, and I'm always very proud to share. I, if there are any questions, I'd love to answer any questions um, about Bud and the film and the footage. And I have a question for you. So, I think in, in text on the film, it was claimed he spanned more epics and more eras than any other filmmaker living or past in history. So, I'm adding it starting, what, around 52, 53? Tell me the years from when he started to when he stopped with going surfing, was it, by the way? Professionally, he filmed his first surf film in 53. However, the very first film he made was for um, a film docudrama person named George Tahara. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of George Tahara. George Tahara made many films on Hawaiian history and Hawaiian docudramas. And shortly before he passed away, I was asking Bud about his first surf film, Hawaiian um, surf stories. And he said, no, my first film was actually a travel log for George Tahara. And I asked Peter Cole about it, and he said, oh yes, he had seen it sometime, and I think George Downing and Wally are in it. I don't know where that film is, but it's probably somewhere in the George Tahara archives, which I hear is some of its house at the University of Hawaii. Yeah. So what would the range be when he started? What was the final film, and what year would that be? Well, he filmed an eight millimeter yeah. um, in the 40s. I would say he did George Tahara's film in 48, and I would assume George Tahara asked him because he had seen some of, some of Bud's work. So I can't say for certain because Bud's not here, but I do have an eight millimeter film that is very, very old, um, and I believe it's probably from the early 40s. He also felt, you know, when you, Bud lived almost 100 years old, and we know him as a surf filmmaker, but I think when you live a hun almost 100, he was 96, you have many different epochs in your life. And it was the same with Bud. He, we know him as a surf filmmaker, but he was dabbling and filming 8mm years before that. Um, he filmed the ca uh, go California coastline. Um, that golden time of California where lobsters were as big as me and abalones were ginormous. Um, not only um, on film, but he photographed it quite prolifically. He also um, photographed and filmed Tahiti quite prolifically. That's a whole other genre of his work, which I'm convinced the world would absolutely love. His portraits of early Tahiti during a very innocent time, and also the um, the Golden California period, the whole coastline um, where he traversed up and down when he was a diver. Um, so, if you were to break Bud's work as an artist, as a photographer, as a filmmaker, you can actually break it up into three sections. Oh, and there's also his swimming time. He was a sw uh, swim captain for USC in the 30s, an amazing swimmer. And he also photographed um, that period, the early California swimmers at USC and, um, oh gosh, the time, Johnny Weissmuller, all the, the swimmers of that epic time too. Oh, um, and the, and the, the Swimming pool swimmer, what's the name? <laughs> that whole amazing, wonderful time in the 30s, beautiful. Um, so honestly, it's hard curating and archiving such a large body of work. You could spend three lifetimes um, categorizing and organizing Bud's work. I choose to focus right now on the surfing, which is a huge body. When I say that he documented surfing longer than anyone, there were people that were documenting surfing um, early in, I believe some in the 30s and the 40s, like Doc Ball. But Bud was the first commercial 
master filmmaker. And I think what's um, amazing about his work is the film he captured of early Makaha in the early 1950s. Um, he captured it from a vantage point that we call Together the Man-Made Pool. I think some of you might have read about this. I'll tell a little story again. Um, if you go to Makaha and you see the bend in the point, you'll see a house with a porch that protrudes out long and there's pillars underneath. And my father always told me the story. We call that house the rich man's house because he had the fanciest house of all of Makaha and he built this beautiful home that no one even had a house like that in Makaha. And it was right there at the bend of the point where the waves would come around by the Kaina wrapping around the big swells. And if you look below it, there is a large um, reef swimming pool. It's quite magical. We swam in it as children, and I think children still swim in it today. We called it the rich man's house because the man who built the fancy house wanted a natural swimming pool in front of his home, so he dynamited a hole in the reef. Well, I know. <laughs> but I would tell people that story, and they wouldn't believe me. They'd say, are you sure somebody get arrested? They'd be in prison for that. And, um, I guess it was true because years later, I was um, after my father passed away, I saw a little lot for sale there and I called a realtor. And before I hung up, I gave him my email, which is the man made pool. And he said, Wait, um, you know, there's a house by the point there. Um, I said, Yes, I know it. He goes, Well, if you look below, you'll see this large pool. Um, I said, I know it well. He goes, well, years ago, a man died and in a hole in the reef so he could have a natural swimming pool in front of his house. And I was stunned. I said, well, you just told me this story my father used to tell me, and people just don't believe it when I tell them. And he said, well, believe it, it happened in 1934. Well, the man-made pool, that's what Bud called and I called it. And if you look at the early footage of Makaha, it's always from a side vantage. And that's where he found it, from the man-made pool. And that is... Um, I think of his all his surfing, that is probably in my heart the greatest treasure. Um, I know toward the end of his life, um, Bud was a, a Californian, but I would say his prolific body of work, over 75% of it is from Hawaii. And toward the end of his life, when he reflected on the best of his life and his work, the place that he reflected on always was Hawaii. And it was either Makaha or Pipeline and Waimea. Toward the end, um, when we discussed, he was very ill, and we discussed where we would scatter him, the two places that he wrestled with were between Makaha and Pipeline. And I always found that interesting because Makaha was where it all began for him. And Pipeline was where it ended um, because his last film that he made, or 16 mil film that he made, was going surfing. We ended up scattering him at Pipeline because he decided Makaha was too hot. <laughs> so um, we scattered him there and where he's body surfing forever. Um, it's always interesting when I go to film festivals, speaking of body surfing, because I know there was a body surfing film in um, the festival this year, and we had licensed film to it. But it's always a treat for me when I go to a film festival. I have yet to go to a film festival where there is not a film that has licensed, that has licensed work from us. Even if it's just one, sometimes it's more. But you can see that Bud's influence in filmmaking is still happening. Um, if you need a historical base and you need something that's going to be from the 50s or even the wedge, I mean, Bud was body surfing the wedge years ago. Um, he has a, um, an incredible body of work in just body surfing. One of these days, somebody needs to make a true historical film on body surfing with real vintage film. Um, but it's just so wonderful to see that it's still be, being shared. I think it's really important 
that whatever your passion is, that you know where it comes from, that you know the history of it, that you celebrate the history of it. Um, I, I think that is when you can get a true appreciation for what your passion is. Sometimes I worry in surfing if today surfers really know how that yellow brick road was paved. And I think it's our job, those of you are obviously here because you're interested in history, to pass on that passion and to share. Um, because we don't do it alone. And even before Bud, there was there were the Hawaiians, and I wish we had films of that, and we don't. Of course, as Hawaiians created surfing. We need to celebrate that more. Um, there's so much more I want to know. I want to know more about George Freeth. I want to know more about the times that appear to be washed away from the tide, but maybe someone knows something from someone who told them, from someone who told them that it's very important to keep the history burning live. And of course, all stories to me are connected. It's all a circle. My father, Buzzy Trent, loved surfing big waves. But if you sat down in a room with him, Reed would probably know this. He's a good friend back there. Buzzy wanted to know who you were, what you loved, where you came from. He just found it interesting to talk to the Filipino laborer who couldn't even write his name and learn his story on how he came here on a boat. Um, in fact, when I sat with my father, he rarely ever spoke about surfing. Did he talk about surfing all the time when you read? I don't. He never once talked about surfing. Never? Never. Yeah. Because surfing, I think, I think surfing for him was a metaphor. I mean, it could have been. You know, people like George and Buzzy and a lot of those guys, you know, had they not been surfers, they would have been bullfighters, race car drivers, whatever. It's just that their vehicle became big wave surfing. But I think um, most big wave surfers that I have known are deeply philosophical, introverted, and many are very humble, the ones that I have known. So, um, any questions? Um, can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be raised by a father, our, our father, who was Nappy Napoleon. Not the Nappy Napoleon that lived today, but he was the, the beach boy Nappy from the Holly Plain Hotel. And so all of us siblings, we grew up serving from a very young age. I started at 10 when I was in the 1960s. And as we got older, we went to, how many of you remember going to Roosevelt Theater to watch Bud Brown and Tennessee movies? They were the movies of our life. We were all surfers. We grew up in a surfing family. And so we looked forward every time a Bud Brown movie came out. It was a big, huge thing to go from Kailua to town at night to go to a Bud Brown movie. So, I have many, many fond memories of, of watching so many Bud Brown movies. I get emotional talking about it. <laughs> well, so you thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for sharing that. He really was a one-man show. When we say that Bud Brown created the surf film genre, literally, um, he took a leap of faith at the age of 40 to quit the secure job as a high school teacher to invent the career of a surf filmmaker. And he literally did it all. He filmed, he edited it, then he would hand draw his hand bills or posters in the very beginning and nail them to every telephone pole he could find. Then he would collect, sell the six tickets for 65 cents at the door, collect the money, race to the projector, run the projector while he narrated it live. And that's how the surf film was born. Um, and then he would tour it up and down the coast in California, or he would come to Hawaii and show it at Roosevelt, McKinley, or whatever intermediate auditorium would let him do it, and just share the stoke. 
I can't tell you how many people um, I've spoken to that say, yeah, I'll say, well, okay, well, what brought you to Hawaii to surf in the 60s or the 50s? And I'll say, well, it's Bud Brown's film. I don't know if I should say that because so many came, but they will say they were inspired to come. And it was, um, he was, a, and he was such an introvert, quiet, shy man. And he was anything. He was the exact antithesis of the subculture in which he captured, which were sort of like the James Deans of their time. And Bud was an ultra conservative man. Um, and he was, uh, like I said, never been married, never had children, very reclusive. But yet it was interesting to me that he captured a time, a subculture, that were the little rebel, the rebels of their time. Um, I remember I asked him once, what was it like back then? I mean, describe it to me. He goes, well, lots of surfing and lots of partying. I go, oh my gosh, because I couldn't believe Bud ever going to a party. He goes, oh, not me. They were doing that. And there's, a, there's so many funny stories, but oh, I guess I'll tell you one about the um, John Peck. John Peck, I don't know if you remember um, which clip that is, but where he's riding pipelines so beautifully. Well, the day before, Bud was renting a place at the North Shore, and Bud heard through the grapevine that there was going to be a party at his house that night. He was absolutely horrified, so he hid in the room all day while everybody came to Bud's house and had a giant party and got very inebriated. It was kind of a very wild time. And the next morning, um, Butch and John Peck were passed out. <laughs> Butch took off, and Buzzy and Bud come to find John, and they see John passed out on the ground, pick him up on either side of the shoulders, and say, well, look at what you've done to yourself. Get out at Pipeline. Butch is out there already. So John goes back to Bill Bra Bragg's house, where he's staying, and gets his board, goes out to Pipeline, and Bud is poised on the beach with Don James, and they capture that epic ride. And Butch's, um, uh, uh, Butch and John's epic ride. I mean, it's an iconic picture, each of them an iconic picture um, that Bud made a frame grab of later. But I, every time I watch it, I'm just amazed that John could surf so beautifully that day, um, in spite of the fact that he was hum had the worst hangover of his life. <laughs> But it was a wild time, an innocent time, a good time. Um, and you know, it's really great because I do run into some, like John Peck, and they're still surfing, and they're still um, still cosmic and still doing well. <laughs> and it's sad, we are losing some. Um, sadly, we've lost many this last couple of years, particularly it seems like. Some have had long lives and some have gone too soon. And when that happens, you say a little prayer, but you're grateful they walked the planet, and you're very grateful that Bud Brown preserved it. I think one of the great things he did, which he had, I think he had no idea the impact and the gift he gave to all of us. Whenever I would say any kind of praise to him, he'd just wave his hand and say, oh, such an exaggeration. But how wonderful it is that we can sit here and like I said, all times pass and new times come. But we can sit here and we can look at Butch, we can look at Buzzy, we can look at George, we can look at John in the time of their lives and almost be there once again. And I think that's one of the great things that Bud Brown did. I could sit here and talk about the technicalities on how he developed the water housing so he could get the up close and personal shot. Um, or, or, or his how he edited his, his films and all of that. But I think what I want to leave you with is the gift that he leaves behind, and to remember that we all need to remember to treasure our stories, to pass them on, and to value our elders because at some point we're going to be there. Okay, and I think it's important. We have so much to learn from that. So without failing to be in the moment, we should always remember to honor the moments that have passed and what it's given us. So Mahalo, yes? The Tahiti film you mentioned, that was his favorite film about Tahiti, what was the name of it? 
you'll dance in Tahiti. None of Bud's films um, are transferred to DVD or available on the internet. Um, at one time in the 90s, he did some films on VHS. Those have long been discontinued. The only time you can see a Bud Brown film is when we bring it to a festival. Um, I get flack about that. Um, at this time, it's not available any other way. Bring the Tahiti film to the French Film Festival. It's French Polynesian. I'm so glad you said that. One of my goals is to show that film. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's charming. It's when um, uh, Innocent Time and, and the girls with the cinched in Bridget Bardot dresses and the, the scooters and Papa Ete just looks like you so want to be there back then. Yeah, it must be shown. Yes. I have a question about the film that's going to be shown on Sunday, Serpent and Fitness. Mm -hmm. Was that put together in the 90s or something? Is that a recompilation or what is that film? Serving the 50s. Bud would say that his last film he made was Going Surfing 2. But I've talked about it with Peter, we discussed this. Really, his last film was Surfing the 50s. Um, Bud had done all his films on um, 16 millimeters. Uh, in the 90s, he decided to reemerge out of retirement and make a VHS film. And this, is, well, this was great because he had made a film in such a long time, and so he decided to call on John Kelly and Peter Cole, and he flew them to California. They met in Bud's house, and Bud said, oh, Peter and John are going to be here. Do you want to come and say hi to them? They're good family friends. So I drove down and said hi to them while they were working. Um, and what was interesting is, oh my gosh, what, 60, 70, 80, over 30 years had passed, and there they were making that VHS film, surfing the 50s, exactly as they had done films in the 60s. And it was a compilation of what Bud felt to be the best of his 50s work. Now, I looked over Bud's film often with him, and what Bud thought and I thought that the best of this work differed. But of course, the surfing, and of course, he would create the comedy skits, and he created these films of his time. But I think my favorite of Bud's work, which you see some in Surfing the 50s, are the lifestyles. Um, the poignant vignettes that when there was no surf, he would be filming, or in between sets, filming the friends hugging or laughing or horsing around. There, there's much of the lifestyle that did not make it into but surfing films. And I think that those are the gems of this collection. Um, we always want to see the historical big waves. We want to see Epic Macaw. We want to see Pipeline um, in the early days. But I know that people are curious, what, what were they like? What were these people like? Um, and so when you see these little glimpses into their private um, uh, backstage life and moments, it really sheds light into the period and time. Surfing the 50s has some of that. And uh, Peter will be here, all the friends, not all the friends, but many friends will be here. So I'm really looking forward to that. I hope um, some of you can make it this Sunday. You can send. Any other questions? Yes. Just something I'm interested in, sorry, something I'm interested in is how Bud's work will be carried on to future generations, because I think that's really important. And Sorry, how, how Bud's work will be carried on to future generations. That's something I'm interested in. And the other one is a book planned on, on Bud and his surfers. Um, a, book a book planned on, on Bud and his surfers, you know, like what we're talking about today. Oh, yes, a book on Bud Brown. Um, there should be a book on Bud Brown. Um, and it should be a big, fat, big book. Because <laughs> there's so much to say about Bud Brown. Um, Ron? Yeah, but I'm going to address this book over here. <laughs> what I do with Adam? Anyway, 
Um, there should be a big book on Ben Brown. Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to write it because, like I say, sometimes I'm so close to it. A big, intent, uh, condensed, autobiographic, uh, quantitatively researched book on Bud Brown. Uh, recently, um, a professor in France just wrote a, a film book, which um, he did a very large se uh, section in the beginning part on Bud Brown. But he is certainly worthy of his own book. Um, and your other question was, um, what is being done to preserve the work for the future generations? Yeah. Right, well, Bud, while he was alive, transferred, um, like I said, he had, in Clinton Tahiti, he made 14 films. He only transferred five films. His body of work is a very large, prolific body of 16 millimeter film. Much of it has not been digitized and transferred as of yet. We're doing bits and in increments. It's a very costly endeavor, and we're still figuring out how to do that. And meanwhile, the film is just being protected and preserved until there is a way to transfer it. Um, in terms of how it can be preserved for future generations, I haven't found the right place for it to live yet. Um, I, I do share, I license film, I go to festivals, I do talks on Bud and his people. Sometimes I have to tell you, it is a daunting task. And I even question whether I am the right person to do it. I get scolded about it quite often. And until then, until I find a better solution, I will take the little steps, what I do, and find my way until eventually I find a better way. But one thing I do know is that I am very committed to preserving it and saving it and perpetuating it for future generations. I mean, I have to believe that. Oh, I'm sorry, I said, uh, how much uh, of the, the film, when you're reviewing it, contains audio? And um, how much was the filmmaker actually making with an intent to make that into a, a bigger uh, narrative? Or is he just documenting things as he goes along? Uh, you want to ask you? Yeah, yeah. 90% okay. of it's silent movie. And then, you know, the part that um, got sound was the movie. Could you the stand movie, that, please? The movies he released. That's where sound comes from. So there's some combination of sound. Oh, uh, she wants you to stand up so they can hear. Stand up and hear. Okay, so the majority, 9% of it's silent movie. So the sound was edited in later on when they narrated into the movies. But, he, he also did some, and that sound also included, but the majority of everything was after post-production, you know, in today and from mm -hmm. so like that. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, and the second part was just uh, whether he was shooting the footage with an eye to make that a, a bigger, uh, like part of a bigger uh, piece of the story, or if he was just documenting things as he, you know. Well, I couldn't answer that question. I wasn't there to talk. I mean, <laughs> well, I talked before the end, but we didn't talk, ask him that question. Yeah. See. I think um, after his first movie and after he realized that you know, people wanted to see his stuff, he came, that was more of the intent after he was created and he started making it. I think it was more of a hobby he was going to just capture it. And then finally he went and started seeing his stuff. So he's like, okay, every year he was all the way through the early 60s. And he was showing that the slice of the At Roosevelt High, like she was talking about. And we have that poster at Gun Home where we're showing at Roosevelt High. It's been back. Mm -hmm. Joe had a question about the era, so mm -hmm. she told you the beginning, but the last, the, the closing, <laughs> but filmed all the way into the mid-70s, too. Yeah. So Going, going Surfing was his last um, actual commercial, commercial movie they showed, and he was, doing, he was in the process in his um, late 80s, early 90s of putting out a new Going Surfing, but um, there was a music issue, so mm -hmm. he was going to re-edit it and put it out there, but he never completed that, so. That's something, a project we may continue. So there is an unfinished yeah. background. He also <laughs> assisted with a big Wednesday as a filmer on that mm, one, too. And that's that right. was probably his last active role in filmmaking, actual filmmaking, mm -hmm. other than putting together that question on certain fifties. But that was a little bit of footage, I'm sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. My husband didn't want me to mention um, a bit. If you're interested, I, did, I have written a new book. It's my fourth book. It's called um, Going Surfing Profiles of Bud Brown's People. It's available online, and I think we brought eight copies um, in the lobby if, if you're interested in um, buying the book. Um, 
Originally, I was going to call this film 17 Surfers because I'm profiling 17 surfers, which is kind of ridiculous because Bud actually had hundreds of surfers. Um, but I selected these 17 for the first part of the book um, because they were the surfers that Bud spoke about quite a lot toward the end of his life. So I wanted to honor that, and that's why I focused on them. But uh, Bud's in Bud's life and film career, he touched many surfers, and many surfers touched him. So um, it's an ongoing right, um, uh, so I can gather them all together and put them all together in one book someday. But we're starting in increments of writing, and it's called Bud Brown Surfers. So Mahalo Louie. Oh, yes? Uh, you know, you talk a lot about Bud Brown being such a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. and I, he's an incredible storyteller. And my friend Paul and I came to the very first movie of the film festival about, on John John Flow, mm -hmm. which had a part, everything was full in here. But we both came away with not liking that film because it wasn't, didn't tell a story. It wasn't a good storytelling story. <laughs> and, and it made me think of Bud Brown and what a tremendous storyteller he was. And the fact that that film didn't tell us any more about John John Flores as a human being. It just showed him wave after wave after wave, just riding waves. Unlike Bud Brown's film, which is you know, more round, more robust story. So, um, yeah, people, younger uh, cinematographers and surfers <laughs> need to look more at him. Who's tell stories? Where am I? Well, there's definitely a different ways to ride a wave and a different way to express it. And we are now at a time that there is a lot of slashing and turning and airing. And, and that in itself is um, quite extraordinary. Um, I do appreciate what you said about the storytelling. Sometimes I wonder, because I'm so close to them, I know so many of these people personally as family, that maybe that's why I'm so much more connected to the stories. But um, I, I do think that people are interested in, in storytelling and surfing. And Bud Brown was a prolific storyteller. He tells the stories through film. Um, and also, there's so much in surf, the, the film that he captured in Hawaii that um, intrigues you to want to know more about the history of surfing. I want to know more myself. I mean, Bud was really a snippet of the great sport of surfing in Hawaii. There's so much more to know. Um, but I, I thank you for that compliment for him. Wow. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you all again.